OK. So let's continue about our exercise for giving interactivity to web application, right? So last uh, time we reached this point in which uh, the HTML is powered by the graphical uh, layout uh, of Bootstrap, of the Bootstrap library. And uh, right now we have a lo nice looking page that uh, does absolutely nothing, okay? And, uh, but it's uh, HTML and CSS together. The next step, we want to uh, get information about when the user writes something inside this box, box and then process it in some way, okay? So what we need to do is to add another ingredient to our architecture and basically learn how to insert scripts in this page. So this is something that, uh, uh, for which the, the server has no control at all. So the server already has given the page to the browser and has forgotten long ago about that request. So right now, it's, everything is in the hands of the browser. We want to have one script, some lines of code inserted into this HTML page that will process the user actions locally on the browser, okay? So we already know that this uh, needs to be done with the JavaScript. And uh, I have here some, let's say, a long set of slides about JavaScript, but I will not, uh, of course, go through them. Uh, we'll try to work by difference with what we know, and uh, especially try to jump quickly to the next step, which is not uh, the JavaScript language itself, but the libraries that we use, in particular jQuery, uh, which is a very powerful language, uh, library that sort of has a language by itself. Uh, because working in directly in JavaScript is very, it's not a possible course, it's very hard, because you need, as always, to take into account all the browser issues and compatibility and so on. So we jump, as we did with CSS, we had an idea, then we jump to a library that already has most of it already done. And the same we will do with jQuery uh, compared to JavaScript. So first of all, uh, what about the JavaScript language? Well, first of all, about the name, the real official name would not be JavaScript, but ECMA script. And uh, uh, I'll tell you why. Um, and this uh, gives us the possibility of uh, adding another layer to web application. So it's not just like CSS making, having a way of making nice layouts on nice pages. We are actually making a jump to a, a, a higher degree of complexity. Hmm? We add interactivity and logic functionalities and uh, responsivi responsivity to client pages. Client pages are no longer just HTML that can be viewed or forms that can be filled, but it's an application. So your HTML page be, will become an application, a client application which is separate from the server in the end, we will see that the, the two applications will be able to communicate, guess how, through HTTP and REST hmm? and JSON. Um, OK. I, I, will, I, I will skip all the, um, the, the history. And uh, the, the end point is that to add this kind of interaction, we need to give or to hide inside the HTML page, some instructions that will be followed by the browser and that will be able to react to what the user is doing on the page. So actually, this is a slightly different picture than what we had. We have our HTTP server, our application, it's PHP, but maybe Python is the same, that doesn't just deliver some HTML code, but embeds into the HTML code, some JavaScript code. 
And this uh, HTML and JavaScript will travel together in different requests, of course, but uh, actually on the HTTP channel, and they get to the browser, they reach the browser. Once the browser receives this information, these two pieces of information f um, are routed into different flows. First, we have the HTML, which is interpreted and rendered, so shown, visualized. And the, this rendering part will also, also take into account all the style sheets that we apply. Then we separate the scripting code that goes into an interpreter, which is similar to the Python interpreter, something that is uh, running the code line by line. It's not a compiled language, this one is an interpreter one. And this interpreter is always inside the browser. So this is our code, we can do whatever we want but basically, the capabilities of this code are very, very limited for security reasons. So I cannot serve some JavaScript code that reads or deletes your hard disk. Huh? The JavaScript code can only interact with two main uh, other objects. Elements on the user window, basically can open windows, resize them, move them sometimes or with the HTML page. With an, uh, a representation of the HTML page in terms of uh, objects. So the page is translated into, we call it the document object model, DOM, DOM, uh, in which every HTML element is translated into a, an object that we can set properties and read properties and change properties on them which is much, much easier than working on the HTML as a string or as a text document. We'll see how. So there's a standard way for the, our JavaScript code to read and modify the content of the HTML page. Um, so this uh, language was quite, uh, quite a long story again. Um, it was introduced in Netscape version two, so just to make a, a, a point in history. And uh, it's an object-oriented language, a scripted language. So in this case, it's uh, similar to Python. Variables are not typed, again, similar to Python. But the syntax is similar to C. Hmm? So we don't have a, a spacing indentation, but we have uh, braces for indenting blocks. So something that uh, the logical function, say, mechanism the object mechanism is similar to Python, and the C, and, but borrows a syntax similar to C. Hmm? Uh, it, uh, the name, the name has nothing to do with the Java language. Now, it's called JavaScript, but actually has nothing, nothing of JavaScript was taken from the Java language, actually. Uh, well, the syntax is similar, but because both of them are copied, are inherited by the C, C and C++ syntaxes. Okay, the name JavaScript was just used by Netscape that at the time that was a small corporation. And in, the, in those years, some microsystems were putting a lot of dollars onto the, on the advertising of the Java language. And so they used the JavaScript name to confuse people, but to just say to, uh, uh, to climb into the money uh, that other people was, uh, were selling. So that Java was, was becoming a, a hot word in that period, and so that name was used just for marketing reasons. So, uh, we still call it JavaScript, hmm? uh, but uh, if we, this language has been then uh, standardized by an ECMA association, so it's a, a standardization body, and so officially the name would be ECMA script or ECMAScript. script. Um, since it's very difficult to, 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 tell, to write and to tell, we, everybody's still using JavaScript as a name. So basically, it's a language that has nothing to do with Java, despite the name, similar to C with syntax, and similar to Python, because it's an interpreter language, has dynamic typing, so we, we don't have an explicit type of variables, but the type depends on the, the object that the variable is point, pointing. At that, at that point in time, it can change throughout the life of the variables. 
and there's a lot of interesting built-in types. Not as powerful uh, as Python, because Python, you know, it has uh, dictionaries, lists, uh, sets, uh, and all, all built-in in the language. JavaScript has less, but already have some lists and, and, and uh, maps, uh, which are corresponding to dictionaries, already built-in. So in, the, in this sense, it's very similar to what we learned uh, in Python. Uh, how do we, how we hide or embed uh, JavaScript into HTML? Again, there are there is one element, it's called script. It's an, it's an HTML element that is able to load some JavaScript instructions either from an external file or embed them to a HTML page. Of course, we will always prefer external files because it's cleaner, it can be separated and uh, can be debugged uh, separately. So actually, this is the syntax for embedding some JavaScript code into the HTML page. You just open with script, you open a tag called script here, and then write JavaScript code right inside, inside these tags. So instead of writing paragraphs of text to be shown in the page, you write JavaScript code that gets separated and interpreted separately inside the browser. And then you code with the slash script. All of this is just, uh, and are all the tricks uh, for, one, for when browser didn't understand JavaScript just to hide the code to make it look like HTML comments. But currently, nowadays, in 2015, none of this is uh, needed anymore, of these uh, strange tags. Uh, the other form, which is the preferred one, is just to load an external script. So we use the script tag. The script tag has nobody. Right? It doesn't contain anything between script and slash script. There's nothing here. It's empty. And uh, we have the source attribute, src, to point to some file that is loaded and interpreted in the page at this point. Okay? So this is the preferred way to go. We include the, the same mechanism that we used with, with the style sheets. There's a point in which we load the style sheet, and there's a point in which we load the, the page script. OK. Uh, let's skip to some uh, uh, practical issues about the language. So I will give you some flashes about the language, then we start uh, writing it. So the syntax, I said, uh, is similar to C. Basically, what we have is uh, blocks delimited by braces instead of indentation, and the for, while, if, uh, and uh, statements uh, are syntactically equal to what we have in C. Then, of course, the semantics of the variable assignment is different. Uh, most operators are identical to C in some way. Hmm? Uh, we have uh, JavaScript is a statement-based uh, language. So we have statements. Uh, the comments uh, are like in C, double slash, or, or well, double slash like in C++ or slash asterisk, like in Java, hmm? uh, in some way. And the statements, in this case, uh, we don't have any semicolons here, but usually they should be there. Hmm? If you have more than one statement in a line, you put semicolon, but normally, you in JavaScript, uh, uh, to make it, uh, say, less ambiguous, uh, you, you should add semicolons. The language allows dropping them because in some way you can guess where they were, but where they were or where they should be, uh, but uh, let's not rely on that. Hmm? So from the syntax point of view, you need to switch between indentation in Python and braces in, uh, in JavaScript, but uh, it's basically, let's say, getting oriented. Uh, variables uh, are just names. They don't have types. They need, to, they need to be declared. This is a difference with Python. You need to declare variables with the var, with a var keyword. You remember in Python, you cannot use a variable, the value of a variable, unless you assign to it before. And when you assign to a variable, you are creating it in that point. So actually, the declaration of a variable is the first assignment. If you try to use it before assigning it, it's an error. When you assign it, you don't need to declare it. You just assign it for the first time. 
a equal 3. Okay, you are declaring a new variable that is called a. From that point on, you can use a. In JavaScript, uh, you need to declare the variable var a and then use it by writing or reading it. Uh, actually, the situation is more complex. You can also use a variable without declaring it with var, but at that point, the variable will become global, globally visible, which is a bad thing. Hmm? because you need the, the risk of overwriting the variables in different functions. So let's learn that as a rule. Uh, variables need to be declared only with the name, not with the type. Huh? As in Python, the type depends on the value that you are loading into the variable. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, I have to declare it in the first line or? Before you use it, where you want it, anywhere. but yes, anywhere before you use it for the first time. Hmm? Um, so these are examples. I declare a variable x, and then I assign to x an integer, and right after I assign to it a string. Uh, sorry, uh, these, are, these are three different ways of uh, declaring a variable. Declaring it or declaring with an initial value. Hmm? Once it's declared, you can assign different values, compute expressions, like you want. Uh, uh, as a variable, okay? Uh, this can be can look a bit strange. It's an increment instruction, but actually this hello, right now x contains a string. And so what does it do? Uh, well, in Python, that would be an error. In JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript interpreter always tries to convert uh, um, uh, operands in instruction. So actually, it would convert the one into a string and then create the hello one string instead of giving an error. So be careful, because when you do some, this most likely it's a programming error, uh, but the, the interpreter will play tricks uh, against you and try to make it work sometime, somewhere, somehow, okay? Um, the idea is that the interpreter should be silent because it's, it's running on the browser machine, and so you should try to get the code execute anyhow, hmm? because there's no user here there, uh, and there's no developer there getting the errors or the logs. Okay, but apart from that, we have the usual, usual types, numbers, strings, uh, objects, and operators, nothing special. I just go through very quickly. Uh, there is just some strange uh, issues with the of equality operators, we have a double equal operator and a triple equal operator. Uh, the double equal means compare the values, and the triple equal is compare the values without attempting to do any conversion before. So if they were equal, let's have an example, I think, yes. With a double equal, I compare five and five as a string, and they are equal because the interpreter first tries to convert the operand and then apply the equality. Uh, if I want uh, only to match value and type, so not, I don't want these automatic conversions, I use the triple equal that uh, forces also the equality of the type and not of the uh, value. Hmm? This is an issue whenever we mix strings and numbers and objects, of course. In other cases, uh, if, you are if we are comparing variables with the of, of, uh, that refer to objects of the same type, uh, they are they're equivalent. Hmm? Um, string concatenation is done with plus, uh, the same as the arithmetic uh, addition operator, so it depends on the current value of the, uh, again, it's an, overloaded, it's an overloaded operator like in Python, but the overloading of the operator and the um, automatic conversion of types uh, can create some ambiguous conditions. So be, f be careful if you, if you create a, a complex uh, um, um, expression. Okay, the control statements, uh, well, I could have uh, taken these slides from a C book uh, because it's actually the same. If uh, uh, round brackets uh, and then uh, the, the true or false case uh, embraces. Hmm? So nothing, that's a switch statement. 
is identical to C. There are for and while and do while statements. So the syntax is nothing unexpected. It's different from Python, of course, but it's the same as C in Java. Hmm? Um, okay. There, is a, there are break and continue. Nothing strange. They just copied the control structures from C when they designed JavaScript on the first time. Hmm? Okay. And then what we do, how we pro, what is the programming model in JavaScript? Well, basically, JavaScript, I call it uh, an object-oriented uh, language. So theoretically, you could create classes and then methods inside classes. In JavaScript, they are not called in this way. Classes are called more like prototypes, uh, uh, this more say complex. But uh, the JavaScript programs tend also to be simpler in nature. And uh, the, the most important object, object type in JavaScript are not classes. Instead, they are functions. Hmm? Uh, they can also be used in objects, but most of the programming is, let's say, function-based programming. A function is declared in a very simple way. Function, name of the function, a list of uh, parameters, and then the body of the function itself. You know, like the def in Python. Def, name, parameter, and then there's a colon in, in Python, and then you indent. Here, there's no colon, there's, uh, there are braces, okay? And uh, functions are very important in, uh, in JavaScript. We will see where and how, because they are the basis for the asynchronous execution of operations. Whenever you, uh, you need to schedule something to happen in the future, when the user will click, then do this. All the client-side programming is all event-based and asynchronous programming. And uh, actually, you are defining a lot of small functions that will get called when something happens. So it's a very strange model of programming. Instead of uh, having something very procedural, one line after the other, or like in the web, web application, many pages that are independent from each other. Uh, in JavaScript, we have a lot of small functions that schedule each other in some way. This function will get executed, and it will schedule another function to be executed on another condition, and so on. So the basic unit uh, of, of programming, of, uh, of organization in your code, are functions. But apart from that, the, the syntax is quite simple. There are return statements. Uh, functions are just called by their name and testing parameters. So it's nothing strange. They are just uh, the main BD block. There are some built-in built objects. So we, we'll come back to this function issue when, in a second when we talk about the events, uh, all the how to manage the interaction in the web page. Hmm? Uh, objects. Uh, Actually, they are how to, how to call them are, are strange uh, beasts in JavaScript because actually every object has a set of properties and a set of methods to call, like in any object-oriented programming. The issue is that the, the properties of objects can be modified at any time because you don't have a real notion of type of an object. You have a template. When you create an object, you assign some properties to it. And then later, somebody else can add new properties or modify or delete uh, those. Actually, every object has a, a sort of a, no, not a sort, has a real dictionary, a hidden dictionary inside that takes the list of the properties that are being defined for that specific object. Hmm? So it's a very dynamic. Hmm? Too much dynamic for my thesis, but uh, it's the language uh, as it is. Huh? So it's very easy for libraries, and we will see it, and we will use it a lot, uh, to modify built-in objects, uh, even built-in objects, by adding new properties to them. More or less the same you can do with, the, with the Python, but here we have more freedom and also more risk. Yes? Uh, 
the object has a structure. I change it. No, you don't change. No, you are not changing the structure of the class. You are changing the properties of the instances. So the, the question is, uh, what about uh, you know, if I change an object? Do every object of that type uh, will change? That that was uh, uh, yeah. a way of the question. Uh, no, actually, you don't modify the property of, a, of the classes. But once you create the object, the instance, then it's free. It doesn't have. Once it's created, it's no longer child of the template. So it's free. It's free to diverge. Hmm? The object is a starting point and then I'm yeah, and then you can modify it and you can add it. Hmm? So there's no type. Hmm? But OK, uh, there are some, we, we'll, we will not go into object-oriented programming in JavaScript. There will be a, a lot of programs don't use those. Hmm? We will we'll mainly use uh, built-in objects like uh, string, date. So the main, the most important built-in objects are strings. Uh, I have some examples or some in the slides we have the mention of the most important uh, 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 functions no? to apply in string or methods to apply in string. Uh, there is one. Uh, yes, there's only one, uh, one catch. Uh, there's a small difference between properties and methods. That may be confusing. For example, t txt is a string. And strings have a property, property called length. Length is a property. So you just need to name it. Txt dot length. You see there are no parentheses here. It's not like uh, in Java that we write uh, dot size, open and close parentheses. Huh? Because that's a property. Properties are just uh, like, like, uh, like in C structures. Huh? You, you take a field hmm, out of the object. In other cases, uh, you use methods with open and close uh, uh, parentheses. Most of them are methods, but in some cases are, they are uh, properties. So they don't need parentheses. It's just a, a minor issue, but it makes confusion when you switch from a language to another. Hmm? OK. Um, because also, also in Python, the length of a string, uh, you need to have the parentheses, not in JavaScript. OK, I will. Uh, strings, I mean, the main objects are strings, dates, and there's a full library for doing what you want with complex objects like dates, uh, arrays. Hmm? All of this is built in into the language. Okay, so there are the predefined types. Uh, you create arrays and you can assign values to arrays. Arrays are like lists in, in a sense. Again, it's a dynamic, you don't need to predefine the size of the array, so you can add any time like it were at least. Hmm? Um, arrays also have a length property, not method, that tells me how many objects have been uh, defined and can be, you see, concatenated, sliced, sorted, like we do in lists in Python. So actually they call it array, but more or less are the same type of objects and capability like Python lists. OK, um, and then well, if you want to do computation in JavaScript, there's a math object that contains a lot of constants and uh, uh, static functions. Hmm? So you don't need to uh, implement uh, or to create any, any object, you just call these functions here for doing the, the, the usual mathematical library. So nothing, uh, uh, nothing very new up to now. No? There are strange behaviors of functions and objects but we can live with them with mainly, it looks like C hmm, for most of the cases, with, without many, much, uh, say, of the, of the syntactic uh, complexity that C has. It's simpler in some points. Because you don't have to declare anything beforehand, or you're, you don't have any asterisks and square brackets and so on to, to, to declare variables. The real difference and specific behavior of JavaScript comes here. Because uh, you, we, you don't use JavaScript to write a procedural program. You use JavaScript to add dynamic behavior to web pages. And the, be the behavior of web pages is always, not always, is most of, in the most of the cases, is in reaction to an action of the user. So the user does something, 
the code should be able to intercept that user action and do something in return, react in some way. It's a reactive programming. And, and uh, the model of reactive programming is the, an event-based model here. So every user action triggers a lot of events. Events are just small bits of information that tell us what happened. And you can associate event handlers, which are JavaScript functions, to be executed when that event uh, fires. Okay? This is the general idea. So an event uh, is the indication that something happened on a web page. Something happened caused by some user action or caused by some browser action. User clicks, moves. Every time the user moves the mouse even by one pixel, an event is triggered, saying, this mouse has been moved. Every time the user, the mouse passes over an element, enters into the area, into the bounding box of an element, uh, or exits from it, uh, events are generated. So whenever you are looking at a web page, uh, you are generating thousands of events. Uh, even the browser can generate some action. You know, for example, you have a page that takes a lot, a lot of time to load. And you want the browser to tell me, OK, I finished loading. Everything is loaded now. Everything is ready. So it's an, inform an event, something that happens caused by the behavior of the browser and not of the user in this case. So for most type of events, uh, you can attach an event handler to those events. You can, of course, you, you will never want to handle all the events that happen. Only a small subset. I only want to be informed about uh, user typing into this text box. So I limit to one or a group of HTML elements and one or a group of types of events. Only when typing and not when clicking, maybe. So I filter the time I, de I want to define as the subset of events that I'm interested in, and I want to attach some event handler, which is my code, one function that I write to handle that code. Uh, this is an example in HTML. How can we attach uh, okay, an event handler to an HTML element? For example, with attributes, we have an input element, and we, we have a new attribute called onClick. So it's a way of defining in HTML event handlers. OnClick on this element limits the scope of the events to only the events that are generated by this element and its children. And these events are or type click, are related to click actions. So it means whenever the user clicks into any point in this input area. And when the user does that, execute this piece of JavaScript in quotes. Of course, I'm not going to put a lot of code here into the HTML element. Usually, it will be a call to a function. And the function is defined, uh, OK, just for the sake of the example, it is in line here, but most likely it will be in an external JavaScript file. And the function will do something. Hmm? So in this case, we use the alert command that will open a, 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 a pop-up window with a message and an OK button to close it. Hmm? Alert opening just uh, on top of the browser. It's a uh, browser function. So the concept is, we have a scope to limit what event we listen. Which elements, which, which part of the page we want to monitor, which type of events we want to monitor, and what action we want to do. We can do that with these on attributes. And uh, once we, so we'll see a list uh, in, in a short time, the list of possible 
types of events that we, that, that we can attach. Uh, for doing that, we need to understand how the JavaScript code is able to interact with the page. So right now, this uh, alert uh, will just write hello. But what if we want this function to be able to access or read or write or modify the content of this input button, of this input, uh, oh, this is a button in this case, but or text area or the text of the button, change the text of the button. When I click it, it changes. The JavaScript should be able to modify in some way the content of the page, okay? Or to read the content of the page depending on what the user has modified or, or has written in some text. And uh, this must be done in a standard way. So every browser implementation should do the same, should expose the browser should expose to the JavaScript code a model of the HTML page which is standard and easy to operate. This model is called the DOM, Document Object Model. The name says it all. It's a model, an object model, so an abstract representation of the HTML document. This means that the JavaScript function will never see, it can, but it will never want to see the text document, the, the HTML page as a text document. Line one, line two, line three of the HTML text. Imagine finding the text of a button into the HTML page. It's a nightmare. You need to, to find the string, the substrings inside, inside substrings and find and search and match it, it would be a nightmare. And if you want to modify it, it's, it's even worse. You don't want to touch the HTML. You exploit the browser. The, the browser already analyzed the HTML for you. It did it because it needed to analyze it for, for rendering, for showing it in the page. So what happens is that the browser just gives you access to its internal structures that the browser is already using for visualizing the page. Part of these structures are accessible, are visible by the JavaScript code. So I can, with JavaScript, directly access the objects that the browser is using for showing your page. Already processed, already interpreted, with all the style sheet applied and all the, the, the cascading already applied. So I already have the, a live representation of every element in the page. This is called the DOM, and it basically Tree structure, so when we, did, when we say that, when we talk about CSS, we say that an HTML document is a tree of nested elements. Okay, this tree is not just a conceptual tool, but it's an actual tree of objects, of JavaScript objects. And every node, every element of this tree, every node, corresponds to one HTML element, and there's a lot of properties, JavaScript properties, so dot something, dot something, dot, uh, uh, class uh, dot style dot uh, source dot uh, all the attributes of the HTML are translated into properties white height so every object has maybe 200 different properties that represent all the aspects of the object hmm? we see it uh, uh, we can see it in the browser uh, so in the idea is that Every HTML tag is an element node. The text also are separate elements, and uh, all nodes are nested. Uh, this is a picture, but we'll see it live on our example. If we take the inspector, okay, here we have the, the structure of the page in, in HTML. Where is that? Let's take uh, one, ex one example, this text area, this text uh, in input text. I can show 
here I have the representation in the inspector in HTML, I have the representation in rendered HTML, so the visualization part, and uh, the CSS properties. Hmm? But I can also ask for the DOM properties. So it's an, a different window here, which at this resolution will be difficult to see, but we can try. We are inside this element, right? And these are all, it's an input element with name, ID, sorry, input text, we gave the ID input text, and class form control. Recognize the CSS syntax, input, the name of the element, hash ID dot class. And these are all the properties, this is an object, that are this long list of properties. And the JavaScript code may read or modify any of this. So for example, we have, uh, where is that? Uh, the value property, it says, hello. What is hello is the text that I just wrote here. If I write hello to, then this property, we need to inspect it again. Sorry, it needs to change, will be changed. And if we change the value, the element will change, sorry, value. You see that you change this and the text changes. So they are linked in real time. Hmm? Not always in the browser here, but in the code, yes. So by the JavaScript code, once you have the reference to the object that corresponds to the piece of the HTML page that you want, you can read the properties to understand what is there and you can modify it. Uh, some properties are read-only, for example, text length, uh, you cannot modify the length. You modify the value and then the length will update uh, uh, consequently. You can have, uh, you can read or modify all the event handler. You see the on, 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 on are all the event handlers that are registered on this element. Right now, none of them, but you can do that. You can register, you can have, uh, and all the, uh, structure of the page. So an ele every element as a parent element, o, o P, P, parent element, you see? So this node as a parent, which is the div, div of class form group. And this parent element, so we are in a, in a linked element, as a, a set of children, actually there they are, they are, it has two children that are a label, and the input text. So it's easy to get lost here, but what we have is a graph with a lot of links, a lot of properties for every node. So it's like uh, seeing the page uh, if you were blind. You can see one element at a time, and from every element you can read the properties and then move to another element, but you can have all the information. It's not visual, you see everything at once, but piece by piece, element by element, object by object, you can have all the information. So your JavaScript code will never see the page in HTML, will never see the layout of the page, but it will always see your page as this long list of properties and objects. Every element has a different set of properties, of course, because the, an image doesn't have a value, but it will have a source, attribute, and so on. The, the attributes here are the same that we have in HTML. So this is what the word looks like uh, uh, in JavaScript. So every node in the HTML is automatically available as the corresponding JavaScript object. And uh, what everything you can do with that node, with that HTML element, you can do it through modifications 
of the properties of the corresponding node. You just need to take some time to learn what are the properties, what is, what is in the nodes. So actually, um, the first problem is uh, finding objects. So assume, let's go back to our example to make something useful. Here it is. So our example, let me close all the inspectors, is like that. So what if we want to call a function every time the user writes something here? We need to associate an event handler to this input text, and we need to define a function to handle this event into a script, right? So let's go back to the web application, and we need to define a script and to define the event handler. The script will be, of course, a static file somewhere. So we need to create a static folder and inside the static folder, we can create a JavaScript file that we may call script. So we have a script.js file. And we need to call this script.js from, to include it in our HTML page. So there is one, you remember we are using the Flask Bootstrap extension. So there is one block called uh, scripts. Or scripts, I don't remember. Let me check, sorry. Flash, flask. Okay. The the, the blocks. Uh, right. Scripts. Okay. It is mess. And what you need to do here is to call your own script. So you need to include. The existing scripts, otherwise you are replacing them. And then you can add your own script tag. Script, source, okay, is, URL for, let's use the double quotes here. Static script.js. So we generate the URL pointing to that file. And that should be it. So we are adding a, sorry, a script tag. Why don't you want to save it? The original file has been deleted. Ah, uh, not true. Okay. So we are adding on the HTML page the link to this script. Let's just see what happens. I reload the page. What happens here? Line 15 in index. Template not found index.html. It's here. What's wrong with you? Ah, so 
So uh, right now it finds a template. Lost script. What did I do wrong? Nice. Sorry. This stupid syntax. Okay. For well, let's forget for one second just to go ahead. Okay, so we have the same page in which, if I see the source, I have uh, in the list of scripts, uh, I have another one. So these are the scripts that were already called by Booster Flask, and I added my one, my uh, mine. Slash static slash script.js. Script with one S. Okay. So if you reload this page, I see the source, and I see that this links to this empty file that I just created, okay? It contains nothing for the moment. But what I can do right now is uh, to define a function here. Change, for example. And I want to call this function whenever the text changed when the user types something, okay? So we go into this input element, the, this one input text, and we add one event handler on, and we have the list here of the type of events that we can you see there's a, lot, a long list of possible events. Uh, what I want is the key up event. That happens whenever you press a key, you, li you leave the key up, uh, and uh, so an event is generated because the text is changed. And so you can call the function called changed. In this way, you register this function, this event handler, in the HTML code. Next step is to write the function. Let's do something very simple. Just tell me something, just to check whether the function is called. So what happens here is, if I reload the page, I write something here. And as soon as I wrote, as I typed the character, you see that the character has been processed because there's a W there, there's a letter there, and the function that was changed or was called. And if I write anything else, again, changed. If I write something else, one, again, and so on. This is something that uh, Firefox tells me that if you want to suppress all these alerts, but I don't want that because I want to debug. Of course, we don't want this. I would like this function, what is that, to be able to read the current contents of the node and, for example, copy it to the other input. So first of all, I need to find to have a reference to the object representing that input node to get its properties. How can I do that? There are different ways in uh, JavaScript. 
The first way is very painful. You start from the root of the document and you navigate inside the body and then inside the div and then inside the uh, form and then another div and then the input. The first child of the second child of the third child of the second child of the first child of the root is the element that they want. Very fragile. Hmm? Never do that. Or get all the elements by tag name. So this is an input element. If I call this method, get elements by tag name, it will, re it will query the DOM and return me the list of nodes with that element name, input. In this case, I only have two of them. But again, if I have more than that, if I try to get all the divs, they will be 45. So the best way is to use the, the ID. I already have an ID. I, I was clever enough to put an ID on the node. So I just can use the um, get element by ID method, which is a method of the class document that represents the whole document, the whole HTML. So what I can do here is, sorry, I lost. I first get the, the input text node. And I get it by document, document dot get element by ID. And the ID would be input text. Semicolon. Let's double check. ID input text. And this is actually the input element that they want. I'm writing JavaScript more or less in a blind way. Because there are no formal types, Eclipse cannot help me very much. Doesn't know whether I wrote this uh, function correctly or if I made a typo. Who knows whether this object that has no type whatsoever is just totally dynamic as a function name or not. So you must be very careful because syntax errors will not be caught at writing time, but only at execution time. So this input text has some properties. So let's Ask again to the browser, to the inspector, tell me I want to inspect this element here and to check for this element, input here, its properties. And I remember having a property called value. There is some default value, which is the initial one that you can set. But what you really want is the real-time value. Value. Value is a property of, of this node. I have the node here. This is the node, the DOM node of the input. Let's write it. This is the DOM node of the input tag. So the text, I can take the text from the value property of the input text. So that should be the text that has been written. And I want to take the text and copy it into the other. So I take the DOM node, output text, uh, document, dot get element by ID. Be careful also with the capitalization, output text. And then finally, how uh, uh, you see out put text. Text dot value is text. It may work.
See what, what I'm doing? With the events uh, handling, I decided when to call this function. And once it's called, I, de I decide what to do. When, I, when I'm called, I, I look around, I find some element, I query the content of the element, I do something, and then I modify other elements in the page. And I let the processing continue. The event processing is finished. Variables are pointer to the DOM nodes. Okay. Yes, yes. These you, we are getting references that refer that point. Uh, pointers. The, the, we don't use point. For the, they are pointer, just like like in Python. Variables are just references, pointers to objects that are somewhere else. These objects are all created by the browser when when it loads the HTML. You just query. You ask the document model, please give me, give me a reference to this node. That is really there, the node. So, so the function get element by D is returning a pointer, not the value. It's returning uh, the reference to the object, okay. yes. And then the, the dot take, gets the value of some properties of the, the object for which we have the reference. Hmm? Okay. So. Say, to be precise, a reference to the node, hmm? not a copy. So let's see whether we are lucky enough. Reload the page. Yes. So what, whatever we do inside here, every time I pre press a key in the top text, the function that calls call, called gets the text and injects the same text into the output. Okay. So what we are doing is something that you can sh see in this picture. An HTML object offers the user to do some actions. For example, writing into. The user actions generate events. Events are registered and they trigger an event handler. Event handler you, a function that can do whatever you want, but usually they find the object, the object that they want to work on, they read some properties from some objects, and they modify some properties on other objects. But the sky is the limit, so you can do whatever you want. You can add a new portion of pages, add the elements, delete the images, modify the contents, translate the language. You can do whatever you want. You are, you are, you are inside the browsers, and you, are, you have full access to all the objects in all the DOM. You are the master of the page at this point. Okay? So usually you have this cycle. Once you do this, then the event lender is done, is finished, it doesn't need to do anything else. Uh, okay, so this is the, the basic uh, idea uh, of working inside the browsers in JavaScript. The nasty part is that right now I did something which is the simplest thing I could think of. Basically, the, the actions are selecting elements and doing something to the properties of those elements, reading them, writing them. We have to fight against the limited functionality of the DOM library. Get element by ID is a good function, but it's the only one that is really effective for finding elements. I need to remember to put IDs on every element. 
or what happens if I want to associate event handler to both these checkboxes? I have to repeat to put the on click or on change events on both of them. And if I have 25, I need to modify the HTML for all of them. So this way of working in direct JavaScript, it's good, works, but it takes a lot of attention and it's quite low level working. This is why people usually work with some high level library in JavaScript that makes uh, the most useful, uh, the most the fundamental functions easier to do. Let me introduce you our new friend called jQuery. Um, we don't have 30 minutes, but uh, we already know a bit of JavaScript, so it's a strange syntax. But if, if we have clear what we want to do, we want to attach functions, event handlers, to HTML elements, be able to find the elements we want, and to play with the properties of these elements. These are the three things that jQuery does very well. Then it does a lot of other things even better. But uh, the philosophy of uh, jQuery, every statement you write in jQuery is, uh, is most of, in most of the cases, find some objects and do something with them, which is what we want to do, okay? So it's sound. All the jQuery library defines only one function, which is strongly overloaded. This function is called, guess what, jQuery. J-Q-U-E-R-Y, six letters, it's too much. So the function also defi de um, defines an abbreviation for this function. And the abbreviation is dollar sign. So actually, in jQuery, once you import the jQuery library, you have one function that is called dollar. It's a valid function name, <laughs> and so they exploited that. What this function does is to find, so you can write it with jQuery or with dollar, is the same. So save the equivalence in your mind. One way of calling the function is passing to the function a CSS reference. It understands the syntax of CSS. So get me, find me the element with ID equal to nav. Find me all the H2 elements inside the div with ID intro. So the dollar function, the jQuery function will query Hence the name. We'll query the DOM using CSS syntax for selecting one or more elements. So it can return one element in this case, or even a list of elements. It's a JavaScript array. Or uh, uh, inside the element with ID nav, find a list item with class current and find all the links inside such elements. There may be more than, more than one li with a list item with the class current. So find all the list items. Like if you want to apply a CSS selector, you will find a list of elements that match all the query, the CSS query. The same here. The dollar function returns you a list of elements in the page. Hmm? There's a lot of complexity, more special syntaxes, but it's not for today. And uh, usually, uh, jQuery returns, I said, a collection, a list of elements, and you can query the length of many items and take the first one, the second, the third one, and so on. So you can process them one by one. Or you can just let, let jQuery to process them as a whole. Um, so, once you have a, a collection of objects 
that you found, you can modify them. So the methods return, you can, met, you can call methods on the returned element or on the returned list. For example, if this selects a span tag, you can change the text of the content inside the span. You can change the message. You can change, if you have a div, you can replace the whole HTML inside the div. These are quite strong modifications, but usually you can modify an attribute, you can remove an attribute. You have a lot of methods for reading and writing all the properties of all the objects. We already know that, we can do that with the DOM, but in jQuery it's easier because, uh, mainly because you can do that on group of objects at the same time. And also the functions, the, the methods that, that are offered by the jQuery object uh, are simpler to use. Hmm? Uh, you can say, there are some examples, add some classes, remove classes from one element or a group of elements that were returned. You can change the CSS of all the paragraphs in the text, in the, in the page. And, uh, well, you can read the element. So there is a nice, uh, no, sorry, it's, uh, it's not here. There's a nice, uh, uh, say, symmetry in these functions. You have, usually you have a method that if you call it with a parameter, it will change the value. If you call it without parameters, it will return the value, okay? So val will read the value. Val x will set the value to x. So it's the same method with one parameter more, sets the value. With one parameter less, reads the value. So you need to learn the name just once. Hmm? And this is general, uh, you can also Navigate the DOM, but um, you can also associate new event handlers to existing elements. We already know how to associate event handlers. You, we put the on something attribute. But we need to know already when we write this, the HTML, what are the points where we should insert the functions, the event handlers, and the names of those functions? That creates a dependency between the HTML developer and the JavaScript developer. And everything I every time I change the name of a function or it modifies something, I need to check all the HTML files. It would be better huh, that the JavaScript code registers itself all the event tender that it needs. So if I want to register a new event tender, a new action, I want to try different options, I, I modify the JavaScript code that registered the events for me without, and I will not touch the HTML code. And so this can be done always, even in JavaScript, we have, you see that we have the on, on key app property, I can modify that and make it point to a function. Okay, that, that is the way of registering the function. In, a, in, a, in jQuery, you can do the same. You select an element, dot click, click at the name of an event. If you call it without parameters, it will generate the event, it will simulate a click. If we call it with some parameter, that parameter would be the name of a function to call. So in that case, it will be click, and our function is called change. So you define a function, and you register that function as an event handler to some type of event. Uh, actually, in many cases, programmers are lazy and don't want to define a function for every single functionality. They just want to write in line the code corresponding to that function. So let me create an anonymous inline function that does the job 
and then forget about this function because I will not need it anymore. I don't want to think about the name for that function. So the parameter of click is a function, a reference to a function, a function pointer if you want to think in C. You can put a name of, the, of, a, of a real function or just define in line on the spot a, an anonymous function. So in, here you write fun, function is the, the keyword for defining new, new functions. You can write it here, create a new function that takes one parameter and the body of this function is here in line. So we are inside the parentheses of a function call, and inside this parentheses we have the total body of a function. It's a very unpleasant to see. And what this does is that it creates this function, it does not execute it now, it saves this function somewhere, and, and registers this function as an event tender for this event. Later, when the event is fired, the function is called. It's, uh, so we will have one time when the page loads in which we register the event tenders. And another time in which the event tender will get called. And that will depend on the user actions. Okay? So the next step that we, we need to do, but not for today because we already have a lot of uh, material and a lot of concepts, is to translate this code using jQuery methods and uh, doing everything in JavaScript and jQuery, which will be, enable us to be also quicker, it will be simpler, and, uh, and then continue with the, with the rest uh, of the exercise of putting the checkboxes and so on. Okay? Have some rest. <laughs>